to order. Um, we will be having open meeting while training with Joe Bertulis when he arrives. He's on the schedule for 7 o'clock. So just if we review the agenda, in addition to our normal updates, uh, we have a accountability plan update from the executive director. Um, we are lodging the filing of a formal complaint. We will have a substantive amount of time devoted to open meeting law training and then a discussion on strategic planning preparation as well because we really want to be able to move our January meeting towards a more actual strategic planning instead of just operational planning. And then we will have executive session both to discuss pending litigation as well as collective bargaining. And both of those are um, being done in executive session because open session would be detrimental. be returning after executive session is correct. Okay. All right, in that case, let's take a look at the November 19th meeting minutes that were circulated earlier today. that in Liz's parent report last month, she had reported that several parents had come to her concerned about people falsifying their residency in order to get into ANSA. So, and that that request was redirected, or that complaint was redirected to the administration. supposed to announce that we do have Tom Taverna on the line. He's participating remotely um, because our bylaws have been approved by Zee, so now we can have remote participation, but it's only in very special circumstances, and Tom's circumstances is geographic distance. Hi, Tom. <laughs> We're waving at a polycom. <laughs> okay. Um, is there public comment? Oh, oh no. sorry. <laughs> Vote then for the minutes. All in favor? All okay. Meeting uh, minutes are passed. Aye. <laughs> okay. Now we can. Is there public comment, Sarah? Can you? There is none. There's none. Okay. <coughs> Liz, can we have a parent rep update, please? Sure. <laughs> One of which was the um, first copy with Dr. McCleary has been has been held. It went very well. We got a lot of feedback on it. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, I regret to inform you that you're not the only show that we are starring. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore me. Um, I heard the parents thought it was great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
there's board or administration approval and or just support, but there's an interest in starting a food search club, um, both on the parent side as well as the, uh, some of the coaching side. So that is something that um, a couple of, of parents have addressed with me, um, and they understand that they would need to um, set it up as a, as a 501c and that it would not be run by the school. It's something that would totally be parent-run. Um, but there was a, you know, the desire to potentially have spirit buses if there's playoffs going on. Um, if there is new equipment needed um, or, you know, sweatshirts or something, um, that they could, they could provide, you know, some of the uh, alleviation of the cost there as well as um, scholar-athlete scholarships. So. Those were, um, that was something that had just recently come up. Uh, I just uh, want to have them be warned ahead of time. Uh, scholar for scholar athletes can admit you um, from getting uh, scholarships in uh, college. Okay. You can actually look into that. Okay. Uh, all right. Is that how the 501 c three? No, it's, it's giving them monetary uh, money might eliminate them from getting a Division One scholarship somewhere in okay. Division Two. So be careful about that. Okay. That's good to know. All right. Um, a couple of other things. Um, the communication has come up again, and there's just been a request uh, by several parents if there's any way we can do sort of a consolidated email, whether it's at the beginning of the week or the end of the week, as opposed to um, multiple emails per day, um, whether it's in a newsletter format or, or something, that, that request has been made. Um, one question I just have, uh, there were a couple of questions on potential changes to study halls. I don't know that it needs to be addressed here, but I was just wondering who would be the right person to address that with, and I can take it offline. Dr. Curry? Uh, sorry, my study hall is yes, Okay, all right. All right, we'll catch up with you on that. Um, and then there are a number of administrative issues that I'll be addressing separately. Um, one, just one other quick thing. Has there been or will there be change to field trips? I know that there was, um, and I, this may or may not have come up in the PTO meeting, I'm not sure, but there's just some questions around um, whether like the sixth grade field trip that happens I'm just like well, well, those would all be directed to the, to the principal or the vice president. Okay, board. all right. Okay, and I think that's it. Everything else will be taken offline. Just one, one quick thing for me. So um, I thought the coffee went well also. One of the uh, process pieces that we added is uh, Folks are excited to offer up topics uh, for discussion, and so I think the process we put in place was that the parents would reach out to you, yes. you would collect those, engage with uh, Dr. McClary, and then out of that come up with almost not an agenda per se, but a list of topics or right, focus right, for the meeting. Yes. So that's the plan. We're actually going to meet the first week in January. That's right. Yeah. So if I could interject, uh, so I had three parents reach out to me asking about, um, you, know, the, you know, there's a lot going around around the uh, uniform policy and sort of wanting to understand what the status of that is and how to provide input and whether there was going to be sort of general uh, discussions about that. My sense was at least I did not attend the PTO meeting, um, but these uh, parents did. and. Um, said that there was some discussion around that and just I guess we were wondering about about that so if, if maybe that could be publicized in one of these weekly newsletters uh, that might be yeah and that is helpful. definitely a, a continued concern in terms of both what the uniforms are going to be as well as the timing of any decisions so So the note that I took for the board on on your report was to check our bylaws on and, and then ask me 
working out on setting up a booster club. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, could you do you think an action item for Allison? <laughs> One of my books. Tell Allison we'll have a secretary. Yeah. Okay. Great. Che I'm sorry. Check the bylaws. About oh, setting up the booster club because oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it's, it's separate from the school altogether. But yeah. Let's see if there's anything. I think, and I hope it's not inappropriate for me to say, but I think in addition to an athletic booster club, their parents were organizing a similar thing for the arts program. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking into one, I know we had a, the art and music teachers had a meeting with them about the upcoming arts night. Yeah. Um, so that's the same idea, you know, purchasing, idea. purchasing right. equipment or yeah. mm -hmm. supporting, you know, attendance and things like that. So. Although I think the so arts what one what is... I would just, what I would just point out is the school has a foundation, the Stem Soaring Eagles Foundation, so they want to do fundraising and designate, you know, the money for a specific purpose. I think that we could probably flow that through um, the Stem Soaring Eagles Foundation and that they don't need to be setting up a bunch of additional tax exempt organizations. Yeah, I, would, I would tend to agree with what Tom said. I know that there's a Developing committee, yeah. uh, Mr. Keith uh -huh. is, a, is dealing with, and I think they're in the process now of trying to put together some strategic rationale for fundraising. So I think a lot of these things are sort of germinating at the same time. There's, but for them to come together in a sort of rational way is probably going to take some time. I know that there were some parents who came to see me in the summertime who were interested in supporting the arts, mm -hmm. uh, specifically music. And uh, what I had asked them to do is to um, see if we could uh, unite the efforts rather than have a lot of disparate efforts. You know, so I think we're still moving in that direction. We're trying to get the recent information about the desire to have a booster club was sort of thrown in with that. And the same, same idea that Tom just mentioned. We have, we have foundation. We have now desire for a booster club for presumably athletics. We have a... Uh, opportunity for support of the arts and to have all the sort of separate attempts not united or not coordinated is probably it's probably not the best thing. So that would come from fundraising meeting. Yeah. Is is it an issue you can identify I mean because you can designate what a donation is for and then it can only be used for that purpose. It can't be used for anything else. I, I so uh, th that's good to hear because I had a parent uh, who was talking to me about it. Um, and said that that designated gifts tend to be um, discouraged, and so perhaps we need to sort of publicize that. Because I, I said, well, I don't know about that. Um, so if, if they can designate, then I would agree with what Tom said and what you're saying that we ought to be encouraging people to work through existing funds rather than setting up well a, existing structure. They yeah. can even do it through the schools. It right. doesn't have to even go through the or <laughs> Eagles. Yeah. I'm wondering though, is the, and I don't know this, but is the concern of the people who are interested in sort of forming these groups that they have, that they want it separate so that there's yeah, like... Yeah, that, that's a different issue. Yeah, and, that's, and that's, then they have control over it. That's right. true, because they can decide if they want this sandbox or whatever, but it's, it's also more costly and your money doesn't go directly to it because then you have audit, you know, filing IRS yeah. forms and all that also. I mean, it can specifically be designated to school or to censoring eagles, like, we want this money to go to stand on this land, or a varsity team goes to class. You know, if something like that, it would be very, it, it can be that specific. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff, can you take that one? Yes, I can. I would like to start off by thanking um, the PTO specifically, and I know that uh, they worked with um, Sarah Snow and the front office staff. We had a lovely holiday party um, this uh, Tuesday. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the board members were there, and we, that was nice to see. Um, the, um, it was held at Sorrento's, which is right downtown in Marlboro, and I believe the owners of Sorrento's are and to parents, so um, they are, they're lovely to us. Um, I also, I think sort of it's worth noting at this time of year, sometimes it's 
parents get worried about the giving of the, should I give Christmas gifts or whatever? And I just want people to know that the PTO gave all of the staff members a $25 gift card to Bertucci's. And so if you are wondering, oh, I, but my kid has 272 teachers, you, if you are supporting the PTO, you are supporting Christmas gifts for, or holiday gifts for, for teachers. So um, I just <coughs> sort of think that it's nice to put that out there. And we, we are very, very thankful for the, the party and the gift cards and, um, and that. Um, it's a nice time of year for that. Um, I think that I would like to say that the, it feels like the rhythm of sort of the school day and year is, it's starting to sort of fall in place. I, I, I think for a lot, you know, when you started off with the all new administration, I, there's naturally some bumpiness and I think people are sort of starting to feel like we're starting to get our feet under us. Um, so um, that, that, that is good. Um, at the last meeting we did talk about the faculty survey results. I put, um, I put a copy of the results in each of the teacher's lounges so that the staff had access to that. Um, some of the staff would really, and I know that this is in the plans, but to get that up on the website um, so that they can look through it. Um, I know that that's sometimes just a, a matter of timing, but that is something that the staff would like to see. Um, evaluations are happening. Um, I know that um, Dr. McCleary talked about that last time. Um, so teachers are getting visited by um, mostly department chairs, sometimes by um, Dr. Curry and, and um, and, and or Dr. McCleary. Um, I would say that teachers are feeling a little bit more secure about sort of what these evaluations are, what is being evaluated, what, 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 what they're looking for and looking at. Um, I do think though that teachers are feeling like the schedule of the evaluations is a little erratic and some people are like, I've been visited three or four times and somebody will say, no one's ever been in my class. So I don't know if there's, if there's any information about sort of you know, you will be once per quarter, or like a little more, more communication about that might be a little bit helpful in terms of what staff is looking for. Um, I will also add that communication is, is just sort of always one thing that, that, just like parents, that teachers always sort of find a little bit frustrating. Um, we also, the teachers are also hearing rumors about changes in the uniform, uh, that type of thing. I think communication about those issues would be appreciated. We did have, I will, uh, the, the last staff meeting that we had, we did meet with Dr. Curry and um, in the, the high school teachers, um, the middle school teachers had a separate meeting, but talking about the firming up of rules for study halls. So um, just sort of making sure that all teachers are kind of uh, on the same page for that and get coming back from Christmas break. Um, that So we did have a, a staff meeting that we all sort of participated in and um, you know, just trying to say, okay, what's what's the scoop here? And just making sure that study halls are being used for academic purposes, that kids can use that time consistently to get work done. It's a, it's con a, a consistent thing that we hear that kids are, you know, staying up till two in the morning and there's so much homework at ANSA. So, you know, the idea that we would use, that kids really have this study hall time um, to consistently work on homework um, is important and that, that things are in evenly enforced that, it, you know, I, I think that the, well, I'm probably getting off topic, but um, that some study halls, you know, kids were allowed to talk or kids were allowed to listen to music or kids were, and so if you were a kid who wanted to get your work done and you were in a chatty study hall, that, you could find that frustrating. Um, teachers were complaining that kids were sort of wandering the halls a lot during study hall. So I think there's just been sort of an effort among all of us to kind of say, all right, Let's all be on the same page here. Um, of course, I believe that that has been uh, swung, uh, swung into all kinds of outrageous rumors about how study halls will be extremely draconian in the future. And also, you know, one of the rumors included you guys, the Board of Trustees has authorized, demanded the study halls be, um, so I told the kids, well, I don't know where you're getting this, stop that, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's, the kids are whispering about the study halls, so I've had my kids' friends have asked Ask me to change it, and I'm like, you know, I really have nothing to do with it. They came to me, and they're like, yeah, I heard it. It was the board of trustees, and I'm like, listen, I was at the meeting, yeah. and I'm on the board of trustees. I'm telling you, I would know. <laughs> yeah. are, are, are kids able to use laptops and, and uh, work and study? Um, the way we left the meeting was that kids are allowed to do to be engaged in academic work. So 
Um, a lot of that is writing up, typing yeah. up, and right. stuff like that. Right. Right. So um, that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Curry, that, that at, the, at the teacher's discretion that the use of laptops to be getting work done yeah. was acceptable. The use of laptops to play music, watch movies, play no, no, games, no, no. Yeah. that kind typing, of thing yeah. is, not, is not allowed. Okay, so, okay. Um, yes. But that's directed study, not study hall. Yes, directed study is a, is a different about Yeah, yeah. So it's probably not. I, I can't speak to that because I wasn't at a middle school meeting that had that. So when I did directed study, this is a year, two years ago. We, we didn't allow it, but the kids can go to their computer science teacher and request a pass, and then they can go to the computer lab and do work. And those those computers are monitored. I've run two of the directed studies. That's where I was, and they can they, they can go to the computer lab. Yeah, exactly. That's how it's Why why not use the laptop? I think they've got the cart in the room, but I think that No, no, I mean, if they have, if they have, if, if they have a laptop, it can, it, you know, could they bring their laptop to the school and use the laptop? I guess that was the question that one parent asked me about. And I don't know if it was directed study or study hall, because I don't know if it was a high school or middle school. In the middle school right now, that's the culture right now. So I think that's yeah. up for discussion over here. Well, I, I didn't want to. I, I just did I do know that when they're using the computer lab, the person who is um, supervising them can actually monitor their screens. So in the middle school, I think that you know if they're on a website where they're playing games or music, the teacher can see that. So I think the sort of level of trust sort of grows as they go with, I, I don't know, that's. So the, the kids are, yeah. I guess I'm also thinking, of, somewhere in the bylaws, don't we also talk about use of or not use of electronic um, gadgets or laptops. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so they're not clocks. they're not allowed to have phones. Yeah. Um, and they're not allowed to be um, texting. They're not allowed uh, that. And part of that concern is um, academic integrity issues, uh, photographing things, <coughs> questions, test questions, texting. So that most teachers remain fairly committed that we don't want to see phones being used during study hall or during the school day. Uh, but the teachers can at their discretion, um, if students are working on a specific project or on work in general, can allow a laptop okay. or a tablet or something like that. And not that I would ever want to open up an Android box with my glasses since we just got it passed. No, but, handbook. Oh, it's in the handbook. Yeah. Okay. Okay, because it wasn't clear to me. I guess some of the questions that I had heard were, why can't we use the laptops to do our work? It is, it is, I believe it is at the discretion of the teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and this is something that every school is dealing with. I, mm -hmm. We just had a principal meet at, um, at Lexington High, and as we were walking around, there was like cell phone policy and laptop policy like stapled up all over the wall. So I mean, I know that this is, you know, and what you can do on a phone is rapidly changing, and what the difference between a phone and a tablet is getting to be a gray area. So this is something that sort of in the long term is going to be an issue that we'll have mm -hmm. to sort of nail down. But for right now, that's where we are. That's all I've got. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? As we look at the availability of Dolores Umbridge to proctor the study halls. <laughs> the Harry Potter. Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry, I don't speak Harry Potter. No joke allowed. That's my department. <laughs> Voice, sorry, so. <laughs> okay, um, let's move to the ED report. Well, I've already, I think it's already been mentioned that the coffees have been initiated since the last uh, board meeting, so <coughs> they're, they're going to be ongoing. The next one, is, as was mentioned, is in January. The staff survey, we spoke about that uh, at the last meeting, and that's scheduled now for. Uh, the check-in survey is scheduled for early January, so that will be sent out to the staff with an email notice to a window for filling that out, um, so the results can be gotten back by the end of January. Oh, that's great. Uh, 
And that's going to be focused in on the climate crisis. Yeah, it'll be a replica of the same questions that were asked. That section. Yeah, that section. Uh, the interim athletic direct director, uh, Mr. Emerald, is in place. Uh, that's since the last uh, board meeting we had a turnover there when Mr. Albuquerque took a new position in projects. Uh, so that's moving forward. And we'll, we're continuing the uh, search for the permanent athletic director. <coughs> there's a, there's an, a slight change that we've asked the uh, Department of Education to look at for the uh, just the wording and the accountability plan for the uh, one of the measures involves the advanced placement test. At an earlier board meeting, there was a discussion of uh, clarifying the wording. We've always calculated it the same way, but the wording could be taken to mean something different than the way we've actually been calculating. So we wanted to clarify it by adding a few words that would say we're taking 90% of the total number of AP tests taken by AMSA students that will have a score of three or better. Previously, as it was written, it could be construed to mean something different. So it's really more of a procedural correction, but we're, we're going to um, send that to the Department of Ed to um, approve. We have to go through the process to approve it, but they've, they've indicated at this point that they don't foresee any problem with approving. So do you need a board vote for that? I think the, I generally what we do is have the board approve it before we send it to them, but we let them look at it first to make sure there's no they don't see any problem with it. So they've done that, and then we need the board to approve that we're going to send it to them for their final approval. We've got a motion. So it's just a good question. It's good wording, actually. It's also in our action. Oh, it's in our package. It's in our package, yes. I have a motion to allow Dr. McClary to submit these. Second. Okay, all in favor? to chair business. Um, we received a complaint um, from a parent about the school's handling of the enforcement of enrollment policy. And so that complaint came in more than five days before the board meeting. So um, Ev and I have talked about this. Um, we are assigning a complaint task force of Ev and Rick. Um, because this is a policy issue, it does involve uh, governance, and it is a moral world issue, so we will get to And they will report that each board meeting is resolved. Okay, so we Okay, open meeting law training. I saw Joe Bartulis walk in, so here he is. Well, we're only 10 minutes behind, which actually is not bad considering we started 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good Thank you. evening. things is uh, electronic media, emails, and those kind of things. 
Um, and so it was written in kind of a bygone day. One of the other distinctions that I would make as it relates to the old uh, open meeting law versus the new open meeting law is the final arbiter, if you will, as to whether there was or was not an open meeting law violation was the district attorney in the district or the county in which one was sitting. So you had situations where there might be one viewpoint in Essex County, and yet the district attorney's office in Plymouth County, I'm just picking those out, you understand, uh, might have different views on things. So the, the, the overarching thing that came in when the open meeting law changed was that the, the final arbiter of this whole law is interpreted by the Attorney General's office now. They're the clearinghouse on all of these things related to open meeting law uh, in executive sessions, okay? So uh, I just mentioned that in case you ever hear somebody mention new open meeting law versus old open meeting law, uh, if a like. Uh, as I said, it centralizes enforcement. Uh, it does alter, as we'll see as I get into my remarks a little bit more fully, uh, various definitions as it relates to um, deliberations, forums, as again with the advent of the electronic media, social media, these kind of things, they've, uh, they've addressed um, a number of those things. So, um, looking at the precise uh, terms of the law, the first thing we need to focus on is what is a meeting. And again, for many of you, hopefully this is uh, redundant material that you're well versed in it, and this will be a nice refresher for you. Uh, but at any rate, in a meeting under the open meeting law is a deliberation, okay, so that's one of the first things we're going to focus on here in a moment, a deliberation by a public body, again, okay, with respect to any matter within the body's jurisdiction, okay. So that is the, uh, the definition under the new open meeting law and largely under the old open meeting law as well. Now, there are certain exemptions or exceptions where things are not a meeting, and I won't spend a lot of time on them. They probably don't apply, uh, at least oftentimes, with boards of uh, selectmen, uh, boards of trustees, and the like, but I will mention them nonetheless. So the questions come up often or occasionally. So a quorum of us are going to visit a site, and we're just walking doing a site visit, but there's a quorum of us. Is there or is that a meeting? No, because the expectation, of course, is that we're just on a site visit. We're not deliberating on anything, okay? But that's one that, that occasionally comes up. We attend any type of uh, quorum of us attends a conference or a training. Again, we're there to uh, glean information, not to uh, deliberate on anything. Um, occasionally, the question comes up, so I'll mention it. People will say, well, what about if we're attending another board's meeting? Okay, uh, one board is attending another board's meeting. If people are there in the gallery to attend and uh, be part of the so-called open discussion, okay, uh, that's fine. You need not post your attendance at that meeting. However, if it's a joint meeting, obviously, and you're going to be dialoguing back and forth, and there could be some deliberation, one always errs on the side of caution and posts it as a joint meeting. But as, as a general rule, if we're just going to be in the gallery attending, we would do that. Now, let's assume that we didn't post attendance because we didn't think it would be a joint meeting. It wasn't a joint meeting. But one of us wants to speak, one of the board members wishes to speak at this meeting of someone else. They are absolutely welcome to do so, but the expectation would be that they would premise their remarks and preface them by saying, I'm here speaking on behalf of myself. Okay? I'm not speaking for my board who may just happen to be there. Okay? Now, um, occasionally the question comes up, what about ministerial acts, um, signing documents, those kind of things. Of course, uh, those are not deliberations, okay? Um, you know, you're, just, you're, you're looking at a, uh, a warrant article or whatever it may be or something else and you're looking at that. Um, that is certainly fine, okay? Now, a couple kind of practice pointers, if you will, or uh, practical things I would mention to you is People will sometimes say, well, what if we attend a meeting of another body? We didn't post it as a joint meeting of ours, and I would suggest that we probably should have posted it as a joint meeting, but if you didn't, then what do some people do? Some people will post a meeting where they will be discussing what may have been discussed at the meeting they attended. Are we all together still? <laughs> um, but it, again, I, can't, I apologize in advance, it is a dry uh, subject. 
couple other practice pointers, you know, when one does this as long as a lot of us have been. The suggestion, of course, is that there not be a, we not all ride together necessarily to a meeting. Again, you may call it overkill, but it does invite the dialogue anyway, or the question, what did we talk about on our 45 minute ride to wherever it was we were going, and could we have deliberated? And the obvious answer is, unfortunately, one might have. The conversations just ensue. So um, one might suggest you not uh, attend meetings or drive to meetings, I should say, together. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, if one is hoping to speak at a meeting that was not posted as a joint meeting, he or she should be speaking only on his or her behalf. All right. Uh, what about social functions? Okay. Social functions, again, are, are fine. Um, social functions, again, the expectation is that we are not going to all um, find ourselves over by the, the punch or the shrimp bowl, as it were, okay, and, and be deliberating on something. So, so clearly, I think, a social event. But one of the points to make, and you've also got issues about forums, okay, so if there's not a forum, and, and you know, two people happen to be talking amongst themselves, um, that's usually okay as well. Where, where people, of course, get into to issues is if someone were, if you, had, if you found yourself, a quorum of us was around the water cooler, and one of us floats an idea. The expectation, of course, is that if the other people who hear the idea don't respond, don't acknowledge it, and do not open the dialogue, that person, while they may have made a, an observation as to their thought, they're, they're, the dialogue hasn't ensued. Okay. So just to be, I want yeah, to try yeah. and clear. Yeah, please. So when you say float an idea, that has to be an idea that's within that board's jurisdiction, not about some, you know, geez, do you think that the, the town ought to be funding a new gym, and that's a, And that's a good distinction. We need not even analyze right. any conversation that goes on that is not within the purview of the board. Absolutely. So I, I'm presupposing that that is what the conversation would be about. Um, but clearly, um, if there's a quorum of you who happen to find yourself near the proverbial water cooler, uh, that's where you don't want to open up discussions on that. Um, there have been cases where uh, people ask for advisory opinions or people have made complaints, and there have been a number of cases over the years where one board member may even send out his or her opinion to everyone. Okay, kind of a reply, not a reply all, but they send it to all, okay? If the other members do not respond, then arguably only the person who sent it would be the one who violated the open meeting law if there was to be a violation. So uh, anecdotally, I'll just mention um, one of these kind of, I'm going to try to pepper a couple of these, these cases, if you will, where people have complained and some of the decisions that have come down to give some context to, to what I'm mentioning here. So um, there was a case from this year uh, involving the town of West Stockbridge. Uh, in that case, the West Stockbridge uh, Board of Health was found not to have violated the open meeting law when one of its board members worked with somebody who was not a board member to get information out, okay? Somebody must have complained in West Stockbridge about that, and they said, uh, uh, these happen to be notice letters to the, to the public, and I didn't review, of course, those letters, so I don't know what was in those. Okay, so we've covered what is a meeting. Let's go to the next key point, and the next key point, of course, is the proverbial deliberation, all right? So deliberation, and I'm trying to get these precisely, so that's why I'm, I'm trying to look at these with precision. It is under the open meeting law, an oral or written communication through any medium, and this is one of the key distinctions, the through any medium is part of the so-called new open meeting law, okay? So this would include electronic mail that is between or among a quorum of a public body on any public business, as Ken had mentioned, within its jurisdiction, all right? So, Two people communicate, it's just the two of them, they're not a quorum, that's okay. If one opines, send it to the next, who in turn sends it to the next, this prefer be like a daisy chain type situation, of course, obviously, that is a no-no, okay? That is a quorum by virtue, it didn't start out as a quorum, it became a quorum, 
Okay. Now, so there are certain things people who take this stuff literally will say, well, is there anything we can communicate, whether it's by email, PDFs, or otherwise, that would not, of course, violate this? And again, for many of you, this may come as rudimentary or refresher, and you're well-versed in it, and I get that, and I'm grateful. But a couple points I would make would be distribution of uh, agendas. Obviously, that's not a deliberation, of course. Uh, uh, distribution of other procedural materials or other things that are going to be discussed. Again, we're sending out the materials. We're not opining on them. Everybody see the key distinction there? All right. All right. Doesn't come up often, but I just want to mention it because, you know, I try to keep track of questions that people have posed over the years. You know, sometimes people will say, um, I have a thought, but if I have it conveyed through some member of the administration or some friend of mine or something, any Clearly none of you would do that, but any situation where a public body is using a non-member of the public body to effectively get the message out, again, is a de facto forum that should, that should not occur. Okay, I'm going to give you an example from 2013 in the town of Wayland. A complaint was filed, and in that case, a, a member of a committee sent out an email to everyone with his comments on a warrant article. And he wrote, I quote, I welcome all comments and suggestions either prior to or at tomorrow's meeting. The AG noted that uh, members should not have expressed opinions about the substance of the proposed warrant articles because that was being sent out to everybody. Again, hopefully that, you wouldn't have done that, but I just point that out. Okay. Another open meeting violation, and this goes to the point I just made about an individual. If an individual sends something out and nobody else replies, the only one who could be arguably found to have violated the open meeting law is the individual him or herself. Uh, another example from 2013 out of Wayland. There, the, 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 the state found, the AG's office found, that a board of selectmen did not violate the open meeting law um, via email because it didn't contain any efficacy by the selectmen. So somebody had alleged apparently that it did, and it did not, uh, that was not found. So the question then comes up with regard to deliberations and these meetings and these forums. Well, we talked about email, but what about social media? Twitter, Facebook, any of these other chat rooms, okay, patch, okay, you know, whatever, whatever means by which one might be communicating. And the obvious answer, of course, is just as it's not allowed by email, it's not allowed by any other social media that exists now or that will exist in the future, okay? So one example that, that um, I thought was an interesting scenario would be where somebody sends a voicemail to someone else and then that person forwards the voicemail and it gets forwarded and forwarded and forwarded. Again, obvious answer is that's a violation just as anything else would be. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, these meetings are public. Um, one time a staff member asked me if I could live tweet during the meeting. And like, you know, kind of be like, okay, now we're talking about this. And I'm like, you're crazy. But would that be a violation? Well, you, you and that individual are not a forum yourself of anything else. So I would submit that the way you, the way you just presented it would not be. But if I was sending it out to the public, because tweets are public. Well, you're just conveying effectively, am I right, what people who were here would be seeing live themselves. Right, yeah. So I, I, the way you just presented, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not planning on doing that, but it's, it's when they ask me. Okay, okay. Tell them to watch it. Yeah, that's what I do. I said, go to YouTube. Yeah, 
Okay. But I mean, our audience members can do that. So, yeah. no, so the, yeah. the difference is, though, is she... <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 she can sit there and tweet out to members of the public. I can't sit there and look at her tweet and sit there and, you know, with her, you know, I can't participate in that as, as part of the board, though. So there's, there's like this, delivering this, back you, and forth. You, you, right, you wouldn't be saying, I agree with that. Yeah. And again, I don't know what, I'm not, right. I'm not hearing that you're giving any right. slant to anything, right. you're just conveying facts. But, right. 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 But, but in any event. Say we're voting on this is one thing. To sit here and say, we're voting on this, it's a really shame. It's a shame that the board is doing this, or it's a great thing that the board is doing this. I agree, I really think you know, that's where you okay. go. Because now it starts to look yeah. like a deliberation. Right. Yeah. So, so again, what I would often call practice pointers or like a couple of tips, um, one would keep in mind, is anytime you're communicating, the collective you, uh, under your, the auspices of being a board member, don't ever convey your opinions or ask for opinions in any communications that you generate. Again, if you and one other person are dialoguing, I'm not weighing in on that. But you understand that even through that methodology, what's to stop one person from getting reply all and then other people getting in on it? it it's just a potential problem. So uh, the belt and suspenders approach, okay, the belt and suspenders approach, meaning you know, making sure our pants don't come down, would be the, to err on the side of caution and just protect oneself. Uh, another suggestion, again, is if you're talking, um, uh, uh, board business to maybe not get reply all. Okay, uh, again, these aren't rocket science uh, suggestions, folks. There's, there's, um, another, there's another one though too, I think, which yeah, is please. It, it's uh, if I'm having a conversation with Ken, yes, and I, we're choosing that medium. The yes. risk is that he's going to forward something on and create a quarrel. Well, that's exactly right. right. So, so, so we keep saying, You're saying reply all, all, but just yeah, forwarding but. something on alone is so just stay away. From that. Exactly. Yeah. They, 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 there's many incarnations, obviously, of getting to the same point. But you're right. De facto, what does not appear at its at its face to be any type of forum can, with this electronic mediums media, become uh, a forum. Uh, another suggestion, as I mentioned, so, um, again, yeah, please. to make sure I'm clear. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, if if I'm if we're talking, just to, yeah. and I say, what do you think about this? What you, that's not a forum. Correct. It is a deliberation, but it's not a quorum. Correct. Okay. Now, that is not a violation. And what you're saying is there's the potential for a violation. Potential violation, I yes. I sent it out to Pauline and say, just a heads up, Ken and I had this discussion suddenly. Well, so, yeah. so, so at that point, it's still not a quorum yeah, because right. it's three. Right, right, right. right. It. Okay. Yeah, whoever that sixth person is. Right. It, right. It, exactly. Right. You're, 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 right. you're getting it exactly. You're right, you're right on point. Um, and then in, 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 when one forwards it, it invites the recipient to opine on, I agree with X, but not necessarily Y. And, uh, you, you can see with that. Um, some people would suggest that you limit email, ideally, again, if it's going to be out to the board for scheduling and those type of things. Okay. So now let's go. We had mentioned the deliberation of a public body on subject matter within the jurisdiction of the public body. We talked about a forum as being a presupposition. Now the question becomes, so let's look kind of a little bit more into the concept of public body. Um, and a public body, of course, obviously is a multiple member board, commission, or committee, um, which serves the public purposes, okay? So it's a rather general definition um, within a county, a district, a city, region that serves the public purposes. That would be a uh, public body if it's a form of the government. Now, <coughs> the question becomes, what about subcommittees? Okay, and we could spend a lot of time on subcommittees, and I'm, I'm trying to give you kind of an overview, so I cut that out. Welcome, I have to come back if you want to put a lot of focus on that. But the, the, with regard to subcommittees, um, they would be a public body if they are officially charged with duties through some kind of a vote that was taken, that's usually the precursor by the public body proper, the overarching body, okay? So for example, governance is a formal committee that was, you know, went through all the formal processing, um, that would be it. Um, some people say, well, what about some more informal committees? It depends on the fact pattern, okay? But one of the things would be 
if it's a group of people who are created to advise or make recommendations back to the public body, they would usually be considered a subcommittee um, within the purview of the open meeting law. Now, conversely, if it's something far less formal, informal, and it was an individual, oftentimes the chair of a board, who says to, to um, I use the example, Susie Snowflake, Susie Snowflake and another, that they can go off, do some research, and act that may be outside the purview of a subcommittee. But the, the point is, is if you've got a formal committee that has created a formal subcommittee, and the formal subcommittee is out to gather information and report back to the committee, that is considered a public body for purposes of compliance with the open meeting law. So, so that would be like when we had our EV task force, right, our search. Yeah, because I always find, I always get confused by that. So like we have a task force, it's not a quorum, but we're doing, it's still a public, it's still a public body, so what is, what does that mean? We can meet or we can't meet or we have well, to? Well, if it's, once we've determined it's a public body, you're bound to comply with all the elements of the open meeting law, for better or worse. That's kind of the consensus. Now, again. So that means taking minutes? That means notice, taking minutes, all the other things that, that go along with open meeting law. Yes. Now, there is, there is an example or an exception that, and when I say an exception, it's really a different example is there is something that, that practitioners will often refer to as the Connolly Rule. And the Connolly Rule effectively says that if, let's call it a town administrator, a town manager, school superintendent as it may be, okay, ED, um, creates a subcommittee or a task force under him or her, that is not done by the body proper, no issues. Does everybody see the difference there? Because that person had the ability to act on his or her own, unlike the other, where the other was, was done by the committee. So they also have to report to the board. When they report back to the board, then it goes on the open. Open meeting law, yes, yes. If yes. they have to uh, report directly to the chair, then they do not. So Dr. McCleary asked the members of the board to get together to make recommendations on a principal. That's not our purview. The principal's not ours, it's his. Okay, if he got a, he asked a bunch of us to get together to talk about that, that is not a matter of, of, of our jurisdiction, it's his. We're making recommendations and that's not a public body. Correct. But it's the ED, not the chair, right? So, the we just did a task force for the complaint. Right. So, when that meets, is it a public body? If they, if they have to report to you, then no. If they're reporting back to the board, then they have to follow. Yeah, that's, that, that's the, the general rule. And I've got a, a couple examples here, and I've got to get just just quick quick notes, but it, but it makes the point. Okay, so there was a case in 2012 involving the town of Montague. I don't know where it is. I haven't been there. Okay, but I think it's out in the western part of the state. I I just when I say I've heard of it, though I I have not been there. Okay. Um, but what happened was the town administrator, and I have, you'll forgive me on the facts, but I'm making the point anyway, that the town administrator had suggested that there be a committee formed to do certain things. He or she could have created, as we just discussed, this group that went out and did something. But instead, they created this subcommittee because the, he brought it to the board of, or he or she brought it to the board of selectmen, who said that's a great idea. They voted to create the subcommittee. All of a sudden, it cloaks it with open meeting law obligations, okay? And does this quorum matter in that? Or the moment the moment it's, it's they voted and they've legitimized, established the subcommittee, if it's only two people, then it doesn't matter, they still have to still open Correct, them. correct, because then you almost, if you think about it, you'd almost do the quorum analysis of the subcommittee. It's then based on the quorum of the subcommittee, not of the quorum of the subcommittee, not the quorum yeah. of the committee. Exactly. Exactly, okay. There was another case in 2015 involving the town of Marshfield. Again, um, what, what happened in that case was a group of private citizens were assembled um, by the special town council, and again, that was not an uh, uh, open meeting because the individual who charged them or created them was acting on his or her own behalf.
next thing I want to point out, and this is part of, again, the new open meeting law from 2010, is the scheduling or the notice of scheduling, okay? There used to be a requirement that you could include Saturdays. It was far more um, liberal, if you will. It, the posting was kind of antiquated. They've kind of revamped that. Again, I won't put you to sleep with all the nuances of the notice requirement, other than to point out a couple key distinctions. All postings must still be done now within 48 hours. However, Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays are not considered as days for calculating the, whether they, any of those constitute 24 hours of those 48 hours. So what does that mean? That means now that if a meeting is going to occur, you've got to post it in many instances a day earlier, okay? There's another nuance, again, I don't want to bore you with too much excessive detail, but obviously all postings properly drafted should state the date, the time, uh, I'm sorry, the date, the time that the notice was posted. So whoever reads it knows whether the meeting is 48 hours later, okay? Now, with regard to... Wait, whoever posts it? Seven. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Is let, uh, whomever no, is charged not, with... Well, no, no. Whomever is charged with creating the posting and putting it up is supposed to say Monday, 11.45 a.m. That way, we know that the meeting has to occur no sooner than 48 hours from 11.45 a.m. on that given day, okay? And the, if you revise the posting by taking down the first posting and putting another one up, again, the belt and suspenders approach is to say, this is a reposting, the original posting was done on this date and time, and this one goes up on this date and time. And the belt suspenders obligation is that it's 48 hours from the new posting, not some bootstrapping on the prior posting, because then you get into this um, minutia of does the old posting mirror the new posting, okay. Um, and there was a case on that this year involving the town of Carver, where there was an issue about the timing of the 48 hours. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and there was a Melrose case on this issue, again, through the AG's office, the statute talks about 48 hours, but it doesn't state with specificity a range of hours in which the meetings need to take place. So the expectation, and this is what came out of this Melrose decision, is you shouldn't schedule it at a time when the general public is not likely going to be available, okay? Meaning that unless there's some emergency, you're probably not, and again, I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but you're not gonna schedule a meeting for 5 a.m. Well, okay, so, so that's settled then. But I, I just point out um, that that was an issue in an Elrose case where the, the question came up about, um, you know, when would it be scheduled? Clearly, you don't want to do anything to game the system to create the impression that we're meeting at a time that's inopportune for the public to be there. So what about the fact that, you know, our meetings are typically at 6.30? Yes. Yeah. So they need, and they just like Thursday, so we need to post by yeah. Tuesday by 6.30. Mm -hmm. But most of these offices Mm -hmm. So that means we have to send it to before 5, or we have to send it to 29. Well, in the, it, the, it seems to me the operative word is posted. And so it should, yeah. the expectation should be it should be posted. So again, the belt and suspenders thing to do would be to say, I'm accounting for the fact that they close at 5. Uh, again, we're not going to spend much time on it, but I remember back in 2010 when I would do trainings on this, there was this, what do they mean? It must be accessible at all hours of the day. And, then there was all this discussion about the newfound plasmas of the day. Do we put one of those in the window? And does that constitute, you know, um, so that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of our things. But at any rate, the key is that you should get it to them um, prior to their closing for that. Well, and, and with enough time for them to actually do it. You oh, yes. No, that, well, you can't send it at 459 because. Well, then they're not the really having the opportunity to right, exactly. So, yes, I'm presupposing that. Thank you. Okay. And what I believe they're listed in the open meeting law. They, they are. I, I would say err on the side of caution. Anything that would be... Well, clearly, I don't know of any state holiday that... I'm sorry, any federal holiday that's not recognized in the state. So it, so by default, it includes all of those. And then any that are recognized by the state, it would include that too. Now, obviously, you've got people who from the gallery will sometimes say, 
well, what about Bunker Hill Day? Okay, <laughs> like June 16th or whatever date that is. Um, it's, it's what? <laughs> no, okay, no. So, so, so I, I didn't know. But, but at any rate, uh, again, as Ken points out, I believe there is a list. So, so it, it's usually not that complicated. Clearly, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, Patriots Day, those, those holidays that some of us may not get off yeah. um, would be included as well. Okay. Um, the question sometimes comes up, not often, but it will be, we didn't adjourn, we didn't finish our business, but all of us are available tomorrow night. Not going to happen unless you post it in the original posting that it's going to be a multiple night meeting. Okay. All right, so for logistic purposes, as we pointed out, for a Monday night meeting, you'd have to post your notice on Thursday. Um, if the Monday is a holiday, a Tuesday meeting would also have to be posted by that Thursday, and so on and so on. Okay, so now people at this point would say, well, what about emergencies? What about emergencies? We don't have time. We've got, we've, we've got water coming up, and I remember years ago um, in the town of Norwood, they had a police station off of Route 1 on Washington Street. They had a, 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 something happen behind the building. The, they had all their records, I believe, in the basement. And the water started coming in when, the, when the, something broke on the, uh, the dam behind the police station. Within a few minutes, the whole place was flooded, and people were having to swim out the casement windows um, with the records, or something, something similar at any rate I was hearing. I'm, I'm just giving away an illustration. If there is an emergency for which there's a problem that you need to deal with, you can obviously uh, meet with an exception to the 48 hours. The question then becomes, of course, um, what would be an emergency? We use your best judgment. If you in good faith believe something is an emergency, I think you're okay to rely on that. However, this does not give you carte blanche ability to ignore posting. The expectation by the Attorney General's office is that you would post it as reasonably soon as possible from when the emergency occurs. So we can't have an emergency, a boiler breaks. We need to meet tonight, but we sit on our hands all day without posting anything, and then we say that we met tonight because it's an emergency. Yes, that absolved us of the 48-hour 48, 48 rule, but it didn't absolve us of having to post it today at 11 when we decided to meet tonight at 6. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, one of the things people also have to resist the temptation to if you have an emergency meeting, what do you need to do at that emergency meeting? Only speak about the stuff related to the emergency. This is not a, and I've seen this, you know, people brainstorm on this. They'll say, we're all here. <laughs> what else can we talk about? It's a no-no. You can't do that, obviously. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, one of the things that, uh, again, the belt and suspenders approach that would be suggested is, if you're going to be making decisions, taking votes at that emergency meeting, what people will sometimes do is either hold off taking the formal vote until the next regularly scheduled meeting, or they will schedule a regular meeting and will bring up the stuff that was discussed at the emergency meeting so the members of the public who didn't get received the 48 hours advance notice can be now be brought up to speed on those things. Okay, real quickly, let's spend just a couple quick minutes on what needs to be in the notice that you're posting. Okay, we've covered the time, we've covered the purposes. The, it needs to list the topics that the chairperson, that the chairperson reasonably anticipates will be discussed at the meeting. Okay? Now, that usually would mean a particular item, and I don't need to tell all of you, you're probably conversant in this, but you want to describe stuff with sufficient specificity that if a person from the public was reading this in a vacuum, he or she could glean without something being cryptic what was being discussed, okay? And an example of that would be, let's assume we're talking about some land use or tax issue, and it has to do with 45 Elm Street, okay? You can't be cute. One can't be cute and say we're hearing it regarding, and they start referencing some plot plan that might be some, some tax record that the town has that a person reading it doesn't know that it's 45 Elm Street. Okay? It might state with specificity which plot we're talking about in the town's records, but it doesn't give people notice what house address it is. Okay. Okay. Um, Uh, 
Um, so a couple examples. There was a Wayland case from 2014. Okay. And one of the cases in the Wayland case, they posted a notice that they were going to be discussing negotiations with non-union personnel. Okay. And the, the AG's office said, well, that has some degree of specificity, and they've seen far greater offenses. They said it was a violation of the open meeting law because if we know that we're going to be talking about Susie Snowflake and Bob Smith and Kathy Jones, the expectation would be that you would put those people's names in there since we're going to be talking about them. It doesn't matter that, that those people know we're being talked, they're talking about them, or that the public knows, because uh, money, much of that discussion admittedly will be in executive session anyway, but it gives specific, specif uh, sufficient specificity as to whom we are going to be talking about, okay? And, and where this often comes up is, let's use, in the school context, a superintendent. Let's assume that this is the meeting. One person that we have well, well that, I get it. But if you were to state, without stating the superintendent or the executive director, as it were, um, people wouldn't necessarily know from that. That may be a meeting they want to attend. Again, that you may go into executive session, I get that. But uh, you would want to state with specificity. Yeah, you know, an example of that would be you couldn't sit there and say, we're going to talk about personnel issues when, in fact, you're going to specifically talk about the evaluation of the ED because if that's what you're going to be talking about, then you have to be specific and transparent in what you're doing. And Ken is absolutely right. Over the years, and again, a lot of this occurred before the, the, um, the new open meeting law, but you'd see these line items in these postings, old business, new business, and it was the proverbial catch-all. And of course, that just doesn't pass muster. You need to state with a su sufficient specificity. You can't have some catch-all hoping that between the day of the posting and when we have the meeting, anything that fits within that bucket is open for discussion. That is not the case. Excuse okay. Me. Excuse me. Yeah. If um, you're posting uh, and there's a complaint, yes. What? Are, how much are you supposed to, if, they, if it's a complaint that's being um, at least brought up, probably the, the main part would be talked in uh, executive session, but what if it has, to, it has to be discussed, I know, at least mentioned at public meetings? Well, again, we, we're talking about postings, and then we'll get into some stuff about what we call the exceptions to the open meeting law. Um, and the protocols to state for the record that you're going from open session to executive session. Um, and, and so that's where that would stuff would normally come up. I do the posting, yeah. so I'm, I'm listening very intently here because <laughs> yeah. we've done some very general um, okay. topics okay. So yeah, in some case. Yeah. So let, let's let's use an example, and again, this is I don't mean to pick on the town of Wayland, but it's another one that involved the town of Wayland. On the town of Wayland posting, this was a 2013 case, the town of Wayland posting had indicated review town administrator contract and job description. Does anything in that narrative, review town administrator contract and job description, create the impression that that person's job may be in jeopardy and that tonight they may be voted to be terminated? It doesn't. And that's where the AG's office said um, it was not sufficiently detailed to inform the public who may be reading the posting that this might be a meeting to discuss whether or not to terminate the town administrator. Um, there's an Ayer case from 2015 that comes to the point I had just mentioned that you can't, like environmental protection matter or something that didn't matter in a town, you can't post it by its, its claim or document or DEP number without identifying the street address. Okay, and uh, they got uh, jammed up on that. So, in that example of review town administrator contract, what are you supposed to post then? Well, if, if, if it's review town administrator contract, again, I, I don't know what was meant by that posting. That's how amorphous that posting was. But if it was, if it was to review the town, the, the town administrator's contract to see if there's a way for us to get out of it, you know, um, Again, I don't know what, what a greater specificity you would want. Um, I, again, I don't have the magic language, but clearly saying to review the contract is so, you know, uh, uh, vanilla that it doesn't put people on sufficient notice. How do you notice. protect someone's privacy? Well, that's a whole other issue. And under the first exemption of the open meeting law, you've got this discuss the character, reputation, and other stuff that goes into um, 
uh, executive session and there is a, an affirmative obligation to put people on notice that we're going to be discussing you and giving you the opportunity, you, the one being discussed, to come in and then there's protocols beyond our, our conversation today that speak about your rights to have somebody there to speak on your behalf and, and do all these other things. One interesting note, however, and this is a key distinction, is when, when somebody is being subjected, let's say, to discipline, there is the ability to go into open session, I'm sorry, to executive session, but the, the, the right holder, the, the person who gets to make the final decision as to whether it's an open session or public uh, uh, executive session, is the person about whom is being spoken. They decide. They decide. So what will often happen is they'll say, we're meeting to discuss you. We're planning on it being an open session. I presume that's what you would want. And again, 95 out of 100 times that people say that's exactly what they would want. Um, but again, if somebody were to say, no, I want this to be discussed in open session, as between your prerogative to have something done in executive session and their right to have an open session, their right to have an open session trumps your right to insist that it be an executive session. So. So there's no protection of privacy, Sarah, if it's a matter that's going to be dealt with in open meeting. And so you'd have to be fairly specific about the matter enough to identify it if it's an open meeting. Issues. So, so that's a that's a judgment call, and and you know, ultimately what would happen is. Either it's, it's enough information for the public, or some member of the public says it's not enough information and files a complaint, and then somebody else makes a judgment. Correct. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. Now, you have, so we're at the meeting. We, we, we've gone, we've posted it, we're at the meeting, and we've got our posting where we've got an agenda, we're sticking to the agenda, and somebody from the gallery, I, I use the example Daryl or his other brother Daryl. They're the people wearing the red and black plaid, you know, lumberjack coats. They're always in the back of the group. I, I joke, but they, 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 they. So one of them stands up and asks a question about a very important topic. I don't get. I don't doubt it. But it's not one of the agenda items. The best play, obviously, is to say, with all due respect to Mr. Jones, that is not one of our agenda items tonight. And while that person can speak, you don't get into an open dialogue with them and start taking, you know, uh, having meaningful discussions about something that was not anticipated to be posted. Clearly, and I don't need to get into this with you, you should have protocols in place where you could say, we'll talk at another meeting or whatever else you want to do. But you don't want to get into the business of deliberating or taking action at a meeting on a topic that was brought up by somebody in the gallery that you didn't anticipate talking about just because they brought it up. Yeah, That's the take. That's the takeaway. That's good to know that it's an open meeting law issue because I feel like right. sometimes people come in and they're like, they can say nothing. And, 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 and you can say, we're not allowed to because it's not on the agenda for open meeting. And, uh, but we so need the, to make that clearer in our. Yes, we're not just being jerks. So at the chair's discretion, the person can clarify what the issue is. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you don't have to cut them off. You can, you can ask them to clarify it sufficiently so that you know what the issue is, and so therefore, we will talk about it at another time. And in public comments, it's not public question, it's public comment, right? They're just bringing something up. <sighs> That's at the description of the yeah. Is that? Yeah. Now, let's take this out of context, um, and I'll just, I don't need to beat up on, on the guy in the, the, the plaid shirt, but so <laughs> he never. Plaid shirt. He's not here tonight. Oh, is there, is there somebody? In no, no. <laughs> so, so, so this individual bends the ear of the chair between meetings and says, I would like something to be discussed that I was planning to 